thank you for being here this morning. It's good to have you all. We are starting off our May with a new song of the month. It's still the cross. Um, this is a song popularized at uh, the Wilds. It's a wonderful song, and I think it'll stick with you throughout the week. I know it has uh, stuck with me. And we're going to introduce it with uh, the ensemble. So the ensemble is going to come. Go ahead and come on up, uh, y'all. And we're going to sing the first verse and then the second verse kind of back to back. And then we'll sing the chorus. And the chorus, you'll know it. It's the title of the song. It's still the cross. And it sound, the, the, the lyrics go like this. It's still the cross. It's still the blood. It's still his dying act of love, compelling me to spend my life in giving everything for Christ, in giving everything for Christ. And then the slides will cue us that it's time for the congregation to join in. So you have two verses and a chorus to learn and then sing with us. I'll signal you then at that point, we'll stand together. And the first words that we'll sing together as a congregation are the brilliant light, the stone removed. And so we'll be singing of uh, Christ's resurrection. Uh, the song, the first two verses tell uh, the story of Christ's crucifixion. You'll hear uh, references to the Roman scourge and the hanging curse of Calvary. And one of my favorite lines of the song that I want you to listen for is, the Lord of life pursued his death and satisfied the sinner's debt. It's a wonderful line there. And then we'll close with the fourth verse altogether, the greatest love, the sacrifice, the triumph of the cross of Christ. So watch me uh, for a direction and the slides for the words, and we'll learn this song together in May. Let's sing together. so much for that opener. That was 
Really great words, really great, great theme, and I'm looking forward to getting to know that song more this month as we sing that together. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Today we're going to take the Lord's table together, and unlike many times when we take it at the end of a sermon, almost like tacked on to the end of the service, although we don't intend it to be that, and I don't think it is that for, for us, we want to actually kind of make it a little bit more of a centerpiece. We're going to bring it into the front today, and we're going to sing here, uh, as you can see in your, your song handout, Behold the Lamb, and we're going to use... A, um, a script that's written, Lay Down Your Burdens at the Table, which reads, Have you ever walked into church and felt crowded? I don't mean by the people, but crowded in yourself, the inward tug you get when the junk of your life clings on and won't let go. When recent conversations, work troubles, and sin issues hang on like a fog, or when there's, when there's been a diagnosis or some unforeseen drain on your bank account that neither that neither you want or can avoid. Do you know the feeling? And in those moments, Satan wants worship to feel like just another obligation. Is this another obligation that we have for this week? Another thing to get done in our already heavy week that we planned? He wants us to view corporate worship, the place where we bring our burdens, as just another burden. But in corporate worship, you will benefit from the singing, the prayers, the fellowship, the preaching of the word. And in those moments, the burdened soul can find unique relief, and you can do so at the Lord's table. And that's what we're going to do today in the Lord's Supper. This little meal we will experience this morning may be just the occasion for you to be loosed from the claustrophobia of your soul. And that's because the Lord's Supper is an invitation for us to see Christ in all directions of our life. Backward, looking forward, looking inward looking outward. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing Behold the Lamb to kind of set the tone for what we're doing with those words as we meditate through that song together and sing to one another as we sing to the Lord. And then we're going to have four corporate readings and, and corporate prayers looking backward, looking forward, looking inward, looking outward before we actually sing When I Survey the Wonders Cross and Partake of the Elements Together. So let's go ahead and sing again and then we're going to work through those corporate readings. We'll sing together, Behold the Lamb, and the chorus of this song uh, is uh, all a reference to our partaking together of the Lord's table today. Uh, so we share in this bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice. And then the next line explains what we're doing. It's a sign of our bonds of peace. This is a symbol. This is a sign that we practice today around the table of the King. So let's meditate this morning as we sing on that sign and what it means uh, we're thankful for it. There's no mystical power in these plastic cups of juice, is there? There is uh, no magic behind it. There is no uh, mysticism, but there is a true redeemer. There is a true bond of peace that we symbolize as we do this today. So let's uh, remain seated as we sing, uh, Behold the Lamb.
As has been inscribed on our wooden Lord's table in the auditorium here, Jesus taught us to eat the bread and drink the cup in remembrance of me. We gaze backward to remember Jesus, whose entire life is worthy of our meditation, the power of his teaching, the purity of his life, and the promises he fulfilled. This is a soul-enriching appetizer as we prepare to eat the bread and drink from the cup. The primary object of our gaze, though, should be Christ crucified. That's what this meal is about. It's for us to feel the body broken for us and to taste the cup poured out for sinners. Take, eat, this is my body. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So if you look nowhere else, look to the cross. But your glimpse backward can go further still. Look back and see God clothing Adam and Eve as they leave the garden. See him calling Abram a father to father a people. See him raising up Moses to deliver the Israelites. See him establish the throne of David. See him fulfilling promise after promise. Remember that God, the God who fed Israel with manna in the wilderness, is the God who satisfied your deepest hunger through his Son. Looking back a couple thousand years like this, is no mere mental venture into history. It's a look down your own family tree. You were adopted into the family of God, born anew as his child. The moment you placed your trust in Christ, the stories of the Bible are not abstract history. They're family stories. Your natural family might be a broken mess, And you probably carry memories you'd rather forget. So as you hold the bread and cup in your hand today, look backward and consider the memories you've inherited in Christ because of the cross. Let's pray together. Father, as we reflect back on your wondrous provision, the sovereignty of your work throughout history, but the precision of your sovereignty into our own individual lives. We marvel at your grace. We marvel at your mercy and your love, your compassion. We marvel at your majesty to have fulfilled in Christ all that we need for redemption. The cross seems bloody and evil, and yet we know that it is victorious. It's what gives us life. Our debts, the penalty for our sin debt has been paid, and we are restored and given new life in Christ. And today, as we look back to the cross, we glory in the work that you accomplished there on the cross. May we see the tremendous sacrifice that you made for us, Jesus. May we bask in the love that placed you there. 
And may we in turn truly worship you today as we partake of this Lord's Supper. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us that every time <clears throat> we share the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We don't know when Jesus will come, but when he does, we will feast on a meal far more satisfying than the bread and wine we get now. On that day, the bride will see her bridegroom, and we will know why John wrote, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We will dine in the city of God, and we will be satisfied, filled, and nourished forever. But as every joy in this life is a hint as the of the fullness of joy in the next, the Lord's Supper is a mere foretaste, a regularly scheduled reminder that there's a better meal coming. So as we partake of this Lord's Supper this morning, look past the uncertainty of your next weeks and months and years and look by faith to the rock solid day of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've seen a very small glimpse of your glory through all of scripture, through all of the experiences that we've had with you. We haven't yet begun to see your magnificence. And in the same way as we've read about your son for many years, and as we've experienced a relationship with him, we still have not yet been able to see his glory as it is. We thank you for his sacrifice. And we thank you that we can partake of the Lord's Supper as a body of believers and in so remember what is done for us. But we look forward um, to his return and we look forward to the real supper in the future with Christ. We do not deserve it, but we're very excited to see Christ glorified to a degree that we have never seen and will never see until that day. I pray for those among us who are not redeemed, our children, and unsaved adults. I pray that your spirit will convict their hearts and will show them this incredible opportunity to share eternity with your son, Jesus, who is the supreme being and who's worthy of all things, and who is more beautiful and glorious than anything that we've seen. I ask that you'll orient our hearts in this way, uh, not just today, but through the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name. Look back, look ahead, now look in. Paul tells us to glance inward and examine ourselves. What does this mean to examine yourself? It means doing whatever we can to ensure we don't eat or drink in an unworthy manner. To examine yourself is to come face to face with your unworthiness. So this morning, pray for the Lord to awaken your senses that you might taste and see that the Lord is good through this meal and ask him to use the bread and the wine to cause you to hunger and thirst for the righteousness. To look inward is not to get lost in the crowd of your own self. It's an opportunity to see your sin, confess it, and rejoice that it's been nailed to the cross. Lord, we come to you today, and I thank you so much for the ability to look in, look out, look up, look down, look always. But Lord, we really need to take that time to look inside take a moral inventory of ourselves. You've given us grace. You've shown us mercy. You've shown us love. You've given us eternal life. We just have to be able to accept it. 
Lord, I pray anyone here today that hasn't had that opportunity says is able to take that opportunity today. Father, I just ask that you continue to keep us looking in all directions to serve you and to live for you in your name and your glory. Amen. All right, with your heads bowed, eyes closed, go ahead and just take a moment and do as we've been exhorted to look in and just have a personal prayer before the Lord. Ask him to help you hunger and thirst after his righteousness. And the final direction we're going to look today is looking outward. Take notice of the people participating in this community meal. Look around this room here today. There are people of Beth Haven who are different than you. They're different in age, background, family, culture, ethnicity, gifts and talents and personal story. There may be people here who you share very little in common with visibly, but you have the same Father. You worship the same Christ, and you are bonded forever by the Holy Spirit. The supper that we're going to partake today together symbolizes the beauty of unity. So as we take this supper regularly together, keep your eyes open. Look around at one another. Treasure the moment of what is actually happening here. And whether you like it or not, this is your family. And one day we will know fully. It will be impossible not to enjoy full love and unity with every one of God's family. And so we're going to partake now. Together, What we're going to do is we're going to sing the first stanza of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, just the first stanza together, and then as soon as the piano begins the second stanza, we're going to walk to the table, grab the elements, you can look at people, you can smile, you can shake hands, you can hug them if you want, because we're going to do this together in unity as unto the Lord. And then when we all are have our cup together and we're back at our seat, then I'll read a short portion of 1 Corinthians 11, just to remind us of that, and then we'll take the meal together. Okay, so let's sing when I survey. church. Well, you, you can get this wrapper off. Sometimes it's a little tricky, but if you can get that off, um, let me read here. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together.
Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, In the same way after, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. This meal this morning that we're partaking is a foretaste of a meal that we will ultimately enjoy together with Christ. It's a foretaste of a meal that we'll enjoy with no possibility of any temporal burden lingering in the back of our minds as we do so. So in anticipation of that day, even now, lay down your cares at the cross and let us celebrate as we sing together of Christ's sufficiency. So we're going to sing now, Christ is sufficient. Let's stand to sing this. John chapter 5, verse 1 through 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up. 
And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Thank you, Seth. All right, we're in John 5. We've been working through the gospel here, and um, we've come to actually a pretty significant point here in the gospel, and I'll explain that here, even structurally what's going on in this text. Um, as you know, we, we talked first of all about how John 1 is the prologue, the first 18 verses, and then we have saw this wedding at Cana in chapter 2, and we saw Jesus talking to Nicodemus in 3 and the woman of Samaria at 4, And really, John 5 begins Jesus' public ministry. He has these individual conversations with people, like Nicodemus, the the woman at Samaria, that Jesus heals the official son we just saw in the last section there, verses 46 of chapter 4. And now we come into this, this, this period of time in John's gospel where Jesus has a public ministry. And this begins here in chapter 5, and we'll go all the way through chapter 11. And John shows us after these Jesus dealing with people somewhat who are responsive, the bulk of really the gospel here from chapter 5 through 11 is actually murderous rejection of Jesus by the people. Chapters 5 through, th- five through 11. And look at verse 18. We just read it. This, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Go all the way then to chapter 11. We'll see where this, this section ends in chapter 11 where it says they want, they, want to, they want to kill him. Chapter 11, verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? Now notice how ironic this is. What's the next phrase there in verse 47 of chapter 11? For this man performs many signs. I mean, here this guy performs miracle, obviously has got a, a power and authority that they, they do not have, that nobody has on planet earth. And they're saying, what are we going to do with this guy? Well, look at what they said, verse 53. So from that day forth, they made plans to put him to death. They're totally blinded by Jesus. And this whole section from chapter 5, we'll see all the way through 11, is going to be this murderous rejection of Jesus, ultimately when they accomplish that at the cross. There's another theme that's going on here in chapter 5. You'll see it. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Well, we saw a feast already before, did we not? In chapter 2, we saw a feast. In fact, that was the Passover of the Jews. Jesus cleanses the temple. There's actually three Passovers that John mentions. That's how we know that Jesus' ministry is roughly about three years. This feast is not described here in John chapter 5 verse 1, But the second, the other Passover feast is chapter 6, verse 4, and chapter 11, verse 55. But John gives us a total of six feasts in John, but at least three of them we know are Passover feasts. So there could be other feasts as well. So Jesus goes down to Jerusalem for a feast, 
And in this feast where he goes, he, or I should say he goes up to Jerusalem, as it says, because it's actually um, topographically he's going up to, to the height of Jerusalem, which is up in the Judean hills. And it says there, there, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in the Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. So Jesus is there, and John keeps connecting this. He keeps connecting the idea of a feast, Jerusalem, and rejection. And again, here is where we'll see that, and this will be the re- first rejection of Jesus when you harmonize the Gospels of Jesus because of some event, some controversy, something that he does on the Sabbath. And so, we have our text today, John showing us the opening of Jesus' public ministry, going down to Jerusalem, and now it opens up and he's connecting the feast, Jerusalem, and murderous rejection. And of course, where this all goes to, you can see it up in, in verses 14 through 18, where this all goes to is the fact that these, these Jews believe that he was not lawful for breaking the Sabbath and actually breaking their own code of conduct, their own code, their own law, and they wanted to destroy him. So our title today for this message is When Divine Authority Threatens Human Authority. When Divine Authority Threatens Human Authority. How do I know whether my life issue is with Jesus' authority? I served as a counselor for several years in a dormitory situation. I was a graduate assistant, and I had guys that I met with weekly, whether they wanted to or not. And I had guys who would just come and hang out at my place because they were interested in discipleship. They were interested in growing and becoming like Christ, and they wanted just to talk. And so I was, dis- I was discipled by several leaders during that time, and one of those men taught me the law of the tea bag. Do you know the law of the tea bag? When you take a tea bag and you place it in a tea cup and fill the cup with hot water, the water activates the tea in the bag, unleashing its taste into the water around it. The hot water did not create the taste. It merely revealed or unleashed, drew out what was already in the bag. And the contents of the tea bag determine the flavor of the tea. We can't blame the water for the taste in the cup, right? It's the law of the tea bag. Like, when you go through this passage then in John chapter 5, you realize that this law is all throughout what's going on with these Jewish people and their own authority. You realize that the situation that the man and the Jews are in only demonstrates their heart and also demonstrates that the Jews love their traditions and how they made them feel or the authority that they gave them and their whole system that went beyond the Bible and gave them a pecking order. But they totally missed Jesus and his power and his authority and how he did, what he did with this invalid man actually touched the core problem. It was like Jesus put his finger right on the core problem of their heart. And maybe there are things that rub you wrong with Jesus. I mean, you may never actually say that because you have a head knowledge that Jesus is God. You know that Jesus is love, Jesus is compassion, but you realize that Jesus is divine authority. And the one who's completely in charge, and this doesn't work for your system. It doesn't work for every little nook and cranny of your life. I mean, it works on Sunday and certain days of the week, but at other times it doesn't actually work. So how do I know whether my life issue is with Jesus' authority? Well, if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life, over everything about who you are, you're going to miss the glory and work of of Jesus all around you, the things that he's doing. And instead, you're going to desire for your own glory. That's how you'll know. Jesus will display his power around us, and God will be with us, and you'll totally miss it. And that's what's going on here in this context. You have the pool there, the sheep gate, there's this pool and for many years, they didn't, they didn't actually know there was a such a thing. They're saying, where's this pool? We don't know about this pool. And then archaeologists uncovered, hey, here's a pool right here. And it's, it's the pool of Bethesda. It has these five roof colonnades. And if you go there today, they put these Byzantine churches on it. So it's really kind of hard to figure out what's actually going on there. But we know there was like these two pools and these colonnades. And these people would go, you know, sit by the water. And you'll notice that the oldest manuscripts do not actually include verse 4. 
If you're, if you're in the ESV, you'll see there's a verse 3, and then there's a verse 5. And you're like, where's verse 4? Well, because some scribes most likely in the side, of the side column of the manuscript, as their handwritten manuscript, their Bible, manuscripts are people's Bibles, right? They wrote down the belief system of that day to explain what was going on. Why were people in the pools? Well, why does the man have to say in Jesus, to Jesus in verse 7 that, he, that someone had to put him down into the water? Well, someone explained that to us, putting the explanation in more recent manuscripts that stated that they believed that the angel of the Lord would come down and he would stir up these waters, and the first one in the pool, they got to be cured. So everybody's there waiting, wanting to be the first one in the, in the pool, and that's what's actually going on. That's the context of why there's all these multitude of invalids, it says in verse 3, blind and lame and paralyzed. And then there's this one man who had been an invalid for 38 years. We don't actually have a biblical record that this, ever, this event ever happened, that this was something that was, that was actually done. I mean, this is not something that Moses said to do. It's something that people believed would happen. And writing this into the text helps explain the context of what's going on in this passage. And so one scribe at some point put this perhaps in the side column of their manuscript and somewhere in the transference of handwritten manuscripts, were, which were actually people's Bibles before you had typeface and all that, this was likely slid into the actual text, and most likely someone was trying to be helpful and thought, oh, isn't this the end of the verse? Let me just put that right in here as I copy my own Bible. Well, no, that's not, and the oldest manuscripts make that obvious. And that's why our text does not have verse 4, but it is helpful, it's a helpful thing to know because we can see that those at the pool were waiting for God to do something supernatural. And their only hope was this belief system that God would somehow use the pool to heal them. So you have the pool and the context, and how about the man? Well, he's an invalid, it says, for 38 years. And this man's family would bring this man at certain times of the year, and Jesus asked him a very specific question. It says, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to, them, he said to him, do you want to be healed You know, the way that people respond to this question tells a lot. Because there are some people who don't want what that would actually take. That would mean that this person would change my life radically. You might say, well, why would, he, why would he not want that? Of course he would want that. Well, some people are afraid to change. Some people believe that it can't be done. Some people would rather be in a state of misery, even though it's misery, because they actually enjoy that, as weird as that is. But the sick man answered him, and he gave us this underwhelming response. He gives us an idea of who we're talking to. I mean, this is a frustrated, loss of hope, unbelieving, short-tempered, perhaps even in the way he talked to Christ type of guy. In fact, one writer says it this way, Verse 7 reads less as an apt and subtle response to Jesus' question than as the crotchety grumblings of an old and not very perceptive man who thinks he is answering a stupid question. Well, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the water when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And so you have the healing. Jesus just heals him. Jesus says, verse 8, Get up take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. And Jesus didn't touch him. He just spoke into his life healing into reality like God spoke creation into existence. And Jesus said, get up and go. And he specifically said, walk. Look at it. It's the last word of verse 8. Walk. And Jesus heals this man and uses him to incite a response from the Jews. He tells him to go walk. And he takes up his bed and he walks. That's exactly what he does. Immediately he's healed, and look at verse 9. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he starts walking around. And he gets up, and he walks away, actually. He just doesn't take up his bed and walks. He does what Jesus commands and walks, but it doesn't say, like, hey, who are you? Or, like, hey, wow, this is awesome. He just, he walks, and he just goes, and he's gone. And, I, and obviously Jesus withdraws himself, right? And later on he sees him, but it's like, this guy just, I mean, there's something going on, something weird going on. He just, he gets up and he walks. And Jesus withdrew, but this, still got, this guy left without even knowing his name or who he is. 
And so it feels really weird, but Jesus is explaining all of this because John is going somewhere with all this. And John is setting us up for what will happen in the rest of the narrative. And so now you have the Jews. And John tips us off about where all this is going with the last phrase of verse 9. Look at it. Now that day was the Sabbath. Enter. Da, 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 da. Right? Look at verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Really? The Jews were worried about the law? And here you have this guy who has his bedroll, bedroll rolled up under his arm after 38 years as an invalid, and the guy who just healed him tells him to walk, and he's walking, and so now you have these Jews noticing only that the guy's breaking away from the rule book. They totally miss it. I mean, really? They don't honor or recognize Jesus' authority, and they are concerned with their policy manual. Jesus' authority and power threatens their human authority and rule system. And instead of rejoicing in God's goodness and his miracle, they interrogate the former invalid who, and who, who could possibly do such a thing and on the Sabbath. But the guy told the Jews he was just healed. Look at verse 11. But he said, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. Well, look at their response in verse 12. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? The Jews hear and see evidence of a miraculous healing and then they see this evidence of their breach of their code of conduct, and then they're only interested in the latter. They totally miss it. They totally miss what's important. And you would expect them to say, hey, let's talk about the bed later and the breach of code, but tell me what actually happened to you. This is amazing. But the Jews totally miss it because they are caught up in their own pride and their own lust for their own glory, their own thoughts, their own comforts, and their own authority structure, and they miss the one who deserves all authority and honor and glory. I mean, who is this one who can actually heal? Could he be the Christ? And the Jews don't want to give glory to anyone else. They like their life where they are the boss and look to what they think about everything what they think is right or wrong and what they think religiosity should look like and what they believe is the best for others and they totally miss what God is doing right in front of them, right before their eyes. They were totally avoiding the topic of someone else's healing power. And so Jesus' authority threatened their human authority. And this is how spiritual blindness works. It causes us to miss Christ and have no curiosity of the power of God and what God is doing in the church for his glory. Spiritual pride makes our own thoughts and opinions of what religiosity and what the church should look like more important than what God himself is actually doing in his church. And perhaps right in front of our own eyes. And just like the Jews of Jesus' day, we all come to the church with certain preconceived notions of what life in the body looks like and what is allowed and what's not allowed. And while we want appropriate protocols and be intentional in all that we do, we can actually filter our opinion on how things are going based upon what's important to us and what we've imagined life in the body to be like. And while these things may even be really good, really good things, or at least good in and of themselves. It is based on those things that we judge and perhaps actually miss the awesome, powerful things that God is doing right in front of us. We miss God's grace for us, and we miss God's kindness to us. And we become totally blind to all that God has actually done for us and is doing around us and in the lives of His people. And instead of talking about how God has provided in the smallest detail in our life, we remove these things from our minds and our stories as we talk to other people. And instead, it's all about the letter of the law and whether people are doing things like we think they should be done. Instead of listening and allowing God to love us through weak and imperfect people, we allow bitterness to grow in our hearts. So we lose perspective on reality and the larger picture. And instead of giving credit to God for what he's done for us and the phenomenal blessings we have in Christ, we try harder, we work harder, and we do things in our own power. And instead of humbling ourselves and allowing others to speak into our lives, we miss the opportunity for God to use his own church to bless us. 
And so you have in this passage this healing. It's awesome. It's powerful. It's kind. It's generous. Jesus walks up to him. Hey, do you want to be healed? Okay, you're healed. Now go and walk. But the man's response is a little bit weird, and the Jew's response is absurd. It's wrong. So if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life and really over all, you will, you will perhaps miss the glory and the works of Jesus all around you. And instead, you will desire for your own glory found in your own religiosity and system of comfort. And if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life and really over all, you will not like it when Jesus disturbs your traditions and presumptions and opinions and religiosity. And I say disturb because in verse 8, I really think that's what's going on. I think Jesus is inciting a response. He tells this man, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Jesus knows. He knows all about the Mishnah. He knows all about the Old Testament law. He knows all these things. He knows what's going to happen. He's telling him to go walk. He could have just healed him and said, okay, you're healed. Let's rejoice. He says, go walk. And Jesus then heals on the Sabbath. He goes against the law, apparently. Well, actually, there's nothing in Moses' law that forbids this. What happened was there was an additional man-made law that was added. It's called the Mishnah, the oral tradition of the law that interpreted the actual law. So it's the law that interprets the law. And the Jews elevated their own commandments to the level of God's commandments in the law. And so verse 10, if you look at it in the text, it says that it is not lawful. It will use that word in the, in the ESV. Well, lawful actually equal, equals Mishnah. Lawful there does not equal Moses. And so you have, they're, they're actually putting Mishnah right up there with Moses. And it was the detailed regulation or tradition that the Jewish leaders had added when interpreting the Old Testament law. And of course, we have to be careful, right, with people's conscience, where the Bible does not say something, we should not elevate our own thoughts or traditions or standards to the level of Scripture. But where the Scripture does speak, where the Scripture is clear, its teaching, its statements are clear, we should hold fast and we should hold strongly to those statements and fervently. And so Jesus wasn't actually commanding anything against his own law. Of course, he is the Lord of the law. He's the Lord of the Sabbath anyway. So Jesus was only disturbing man-made traditions putting his finger right on those presumptions, those opinions, those religiosities of the day. And Jesus disturbs what they knew or what they think is the right way. Instead of life being about the grace of God, instead of life being about the movement of God and what God is doing, the power of God, we can also often miss all that for our traditions, our self-righteous assumptions and presumptions. And if we understand the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross some 2,000 years ago and he paid the penalty of our sin once and for all, that it's not by works of righteousness that somehow we can gain our way to heaven, merit our way to heaven, but it's only through him that Jesus Christ is my only hope and has nothing to do with myself or my merit or my upbringing or my goodness, but that life is all about Jesus' honor and Jesus' authority and Jesus' glory and that anything in it that gets in the way of that has got to go. And even after I'm a Christian, Jesus will constantly disturb those things that simply make me feel good about myself as a person or I feel like I'm really a good Christian because Jesus deserves all honor and all authority and all glory. He alone will judge our traditions. He alone will judge our presumptions, our opinions and religiosity. And he alone will set in order all things in our life and make us feel uncomfortable, even in our self-righteousness. Or maybe it is in Jesus is, dis is disturbing us about those things that make us feel good. Maybe even this morning he's disturbing your soul right now about those things that are bad. But maybe we've judged those things not that bad because overall you think, I'm doing pretty good. And of course, when we compare ourselves with people around us, our neighbors or other Christians, and we think, I'm doing pretty good with my life or my system that's working for me. Jesus graciously disturbs our comfortable perspective. And so if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life, you're going to miss out on what God's actually doing all around you. And you're not going to like it when he disturbs you, your traditions and your own thinking. And your false authority will be exposed and confronted by Jesus' true authority. 
Jesus found the man in the temple and he spoke to him. Let's look at it. Verse 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. And as there was a crowd in the place, verse 14, and afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. What this text infers is that this man's suffering was connected to this man's sin. Now, we don't know what the sin was or the nature of it, but there seems to be a direct link in this context, and Jesus puts his finger on the core problem with this man, and he commands the man. The word is in the imperative in verse 14. Look at it. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Sin and suffering are connected at times, definitely not all the time, but can be at times in our lives. That's why when we take communion, we don't want to mock what we're doing. We don't want to make a mockery of it. 1 Corinthians 11, I read that for us even today as we began, that we, we, don't, want to, we don't want to eat and drink in an unworthy manner, to be guilty concerning the blood, blood and body of the Lord. Because Jesus is king, bow to him, humble yourselves before him. What we're doing with the Lord's table today actually really matters. I mean, think of Ananias and Sapphira. And of course, it's not always this way, right? John chapter 9, a few chapters later, you're going to see there's a man who's born blind, and the disciples are going to ask Jesus, you know, who sinned, his parents or him, that he would be born blind? And Jesus said, well, neither. That's not the, there's no connection that way in this guy's context, but this was just that the works of God might be displayed in him. So if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life and really overall, your false authority will be exposed and confronted by Jesus' true authority. He'll put his finger right on the problem. I mean, we're made in God's image. And we are creatures who like to have dominion, and that's good and right. I mean, we like to have our own authority. We like to be king over our territory, our plot of land that we live on, whether it's a one-bedroom apartment or multiple acres. And that's fine. But it's not fine when our ideas are not aligned with the one who has all authority and all power and demands all glory in the universe. And when we give into temptation that questions God, like the serpent who deceived our first parents, when we become king of our own lives, king over what we see and what we desire and king over our experiences, experiences that are not in the plan of King Jesus, then Jesus' authority threatens our human authority. And so, my friend, bow the knee today to Jesus. Let us all, let us all together as a church, let's see him high and lift it up. And if you know Jesus, you know he is compassionate. You know he's caring. You know he's a loving king. So come to him today. He's still king, so bow the knee. But he's a loving king who paid the price for our sins so that we could serve him. Serve him as Lord. And of course, none of us in this room today have all things put together perfectly, do we? None of us are perfect people and somehow we have met God in his goodness. We're all broken people in this room who have come to King Jesus in our sin. And we come to him because he alone will give us hope. And unlike the Jews in this passage, Our eyes, for many of us, are actually open. We're open to the actual condition that without Christ and and Jesus, without his direct word to us in the gospel, we will not find deliverance. But look at what happens to these Jewish authorities. They are disgusted, verse 15. He told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him, verse 16, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. Well, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so this man went to Jewish authorities and told him that Jesus, Jesus was the guy who healed him. So the Jews now persecute Jesus because Jesus did these things on the Sabbath. Jesus didn't keep their man-made traditions, like don't carry your mat on the Sabbath. And they're like, how dare you do that? You can't do that. That's against the law. That's, that's not lawful. We don't do those type of things around here. 
And instead, what Jesus does is he doesn't try to argue with them. Notice, he doesn't try to say, well, look, the Mishnah is actually not Moses. Let me just explain to you what that, how this actually works. He doesn't go there. Jesus does not defend himself by distinguishing between the Old Testament and the tradition. Instead, he provides an argument that we would not expect. Jesus argues that God is working until now. Okay, well, every rabbi would agree that God is working continuously. And so Jesus is working too. Jesus' work includes telling the invalid to carry the map, but it also includes healing him. And so what you actually have here, my father is working until now, and I am working. My father has always been working. There's this preservation that's been going on, and Jesus is working with the father simultaneously. That's what Jesus, what's what the word says. So Jesus is arguing that whatever factors justify God's continuous work on the Sabbath justify his. And this is why the Jews all the more want to kill him. Just like God was working on the Sabbath, Jesus is working on the Sabbath. And the Jews understood what Jesus was actually saying. They understood the profundity of it. Jesus was calling God his own father, and he's making himself equal with God. And it was this ultimate boast of authority, this supreme universal authority, that disgusted the Jews, and they sought to kill him. But we know the Scripture teaches this is true. Jesus is God. John taught, taught us in the very first verse of this book, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At the end of this book, we're going to see Thomas bow down, my Lord and my God. Romans 9, 5, my, our great God. Titus 2.13, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.8, your throne, O God, is forever. Over and over and over and ever over, we see that Jesus Christ is God, and not only that, he deserves that we bow to him. He's been given a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But if you, but if you know Jesus... If you know his grace and mercy that allows us to actually see today, to see the mercies that he's doing all around us, even in our own church here, to see what God has done even this past week, the the details of how he's cared for you, It causes us to be thankful and to enjoy the restoration and healing that only Jesus' authority and power can provide. Because our eyes are open to Jesus and to his authority, we have this new perspective that his grace, that his grace comes and becomes and comes, we know it's going to come because he has authority. We start looking to his authority as the only hope. Because he has authority, he will really restore me. He will really heal me. He'll do it thoroughly and he'll do it to the very end. And his grace can pour out to me beyond measure because he's the king of kings. And that's what he does. And I embrace his authority. And we will never lack because all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. And we will never be alone because there is nowhere his love and power cannot touch us. So if you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life today or really over everything, you will miss the glory and works of Jesus all around you. And instead, you will desire for your own glory found in your own religiosity and system of comfort. If you do not honor Jesus and recognize his authority over your life, you will not like it when he disturbs your tradition, disturbs your opinions that don't coincide with his. And your false authority will be exposed. Jesus will confront you on that. In fact, the next section, the next percopies, talk about the authority of the Son. That the Son does what the Father has given. And the Father has given the, the, the task, the role to the Son to execute judgment and have all authority, like in verse 27. And so the Father wants all honor to be given to the Son. 
Who does not honor the son, verse 23, does not honor the father who sent him. See, here, that's where I'm getting it, that we have to honor and give all authority to Jesus. So how would you describe your submission to Jesus today? Our hearts are a battlefield, someone said. Two opposing forces clash violently each day. Our desire for autonomous self-rule engages in a fierce battle with an appropriate desire to submit to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of who we are or what situation we're in, we, we must diligently fight to obey Christ, putting to death our desires to be in charge. It's a battle we can win only by the power, powerful work of Christ within us. So personally, what have you submitted to Jesus? Are there parts of your life that Jesus does not have authority? Well, let's ask him right now in your heart. Just, just cry out to God. Say, Lord, any nook and cranny in my life that is not under your governance, Lord, please take it. Ask him to do a work in your heart. Ask him to help me know. Help me humble myself. I don't want to humble myself, so help me do what I don't want in that area. And come before him with that, and he will honor that type of prayer. And he'll give you as the king, he'll pour out that grace with those honest requests before him. Like only the king of kings and your creator who, who, who bought you with his precious blood can do. So let's trust him in doing that even today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for scripture. We thank you that we can trust you with everything. And Lord, we pray even as we sing that we would sing these, this, these words in spirit and truth, all hail all the power of Jesus' name, and we would enjoy these words and we would ask you to reign over us completely to let no rebel power win in our own hearts. And we thank you, King Jesus. Amen. Let's sing, I'll, pay, I'll, I'll hail the power. You can stand, please. Let's stand together and sing. Say the angels will crown him Lord of Lord. The chosen seed of Israel's race will crown him Lord and Lord. Every kindred, every tribe will crown him Lord of Lords. And we'll sing with yonder sacred thong, throng, uh, crown him Lord of all. Let's sing together. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
do that? Do you want to do that now, Kevin? Yeah. Okay. Today, but if we could have our graduates come up, we want to do this just to recognize them. Uh, Kate Burr, our graduate degree, and then um, Nathan Schweitzer is actually not well today. He texted um, Pastor Rich and I this morning, but um, we are so thankful for him and his finishing his Master of Divinity, sometimes known as the Master of Infinity, but he got through it. And then um, Anna Rose, um, is she here today? She's not here, okay. And then JC Spare, there, okay, hey, there you are, very good. And then Seth DePew, awesome. So let me give uh, these, these cards and JC, let's see, Kate and Seth. And uh, we are so thankful for you. We're so thankful for your investment in yourselves for the Lord's glory, and we just want to uh, acknowledge you in that. Let's just give them a round of applause. And, uh, and I would just like to pray for you if I could, please. Lord, I just think of uh, your grace in our lives and just how you have brought certain people in our congregation and the gifts and talents and how you have, how they have really stewarded those things well and, and, and even gone the extra mile to make them more useful for your name's sake in our community. I think of Kate and all that she's doing in the public schools as she teaches tirelessly and cares and loves for those students and now for teachers this fall. Lord, I thank you how she has put herself in a position where she can be a light, a gospel light in a marvelous way. And Lord, we pray that that would be, that her light would shine, that other people would see it and glorify the Father in heaven. And Lord, we pray that would be true even as it has already been and that you would, she would only, it would only magnify her ministry because of this, pr- this program she's gone through. We think the same for Nathan. We pray even as he's looking for opportunities and Lord, we pray you would bless him and his beautiful family, that you would make your face to shine upon them, that your way may be known upon this earth, your salvation to the nations. Lord, we think of Anna Rose. We're th- so thankful for her. We pray you'd bless her. And, um, and that she would be able to have clarity even as she moves into the next steps in her life. And we think of JC and um, the, the wonderful things that he's doing in our congregation and how he is uh, working tirelessly on our behalf. We pray that you would bless him and his beautiful family. And then Seth, Lord, we pray for he and Rachel as they um, are making plans now as he has finished uh, what their next steps would be. I pray you'd give them wisdom and guidance and favor Lord, we're so thankful for them. And and even as representative of so many people in our congregation who are working tirelessly on their own, doing things in their own way to continue to grow and to not stay the same so that they continue to be able to use for your service and as a light in our community. And Lord, we pray that you would use Beth Haven, even as we've been positioned just a couple blocks from an elementary school and in this community of many, many roofs. Lord, may we, may people know that we exist May people know that we care. And may people know that Jesus saves. And we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Pastor Rich. As we were singing that last song, I was thinking about the power of God. Not only does he have authority, but he has a power to do things. Uh, just thinking about our own authority. We have authority, but... Have you ever made a bad choice? Have you ever done anything wrong? <laughs> Some people know that. <laughs> we make mistakes all the time, don't we? The neat thing about it is God never makes a mistake. He not only has the authority and power to do something, He's always right. And what He does for us is always right. What a blessing that is. So we have the opportunity now in just a few minutes to get together and share how God is working in our heart and lives right now so that we might apply what we've seen in his word today. We have our connections time. Even if you're a visitor here for the first time, what we're going to do is just sit down and apply what we've seen in scripture to ourselves personally and share what God is teaching us through this and how he desires to grow us seeing how 
uh, what we see that he wants us to grow in. And so we encourage everyone to participate in that. We'll be meeting in the fellowship hall in small groups where we can get connected a little bit during our connections time, have prayer with one another, and then uh, apply what we've seen today. After the connections time, uh, we're going to uh, have a family meeting. So we'll have lunch if you hopefully you brought a picnic lunch. And uh, we'll be spending some time together just sharing what uh, God is doing in our life as a church. Uh, several testimonies being given. Uh, we're going to be voting on uh, Lindsay as a new member in our church, uh, having given her testimony at our last family meeting and several other new things that are coming up that Kevin and I want to share with you. And so uh, just anticipate that uh, we'll some, have an enjoyable time together in our family meeting during our lunchtime. And then next Saturday, men, remember at 8.30 in the morning, we'll be having men's prayer breakfast. Bob called yesterday morning and said, is it today or is it next week? It's next week, brother. <laughs> so we'll be getting next, together next week on Sunday morning for prayer breakfast. Uh, we'll have prayer together at 8.30 and then have a breakfast. And then after that, a devotional together. Ben will be leading that next week. So uh, encourage you all to be here as a part of that. Make sure you greet one another and uh, welcome our, our gifts, our, our friends from the neighborhood or the visitors from the neighborhood and make sure that you get to know